Welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite, a show that will help you transform your marketing from mere messaging to programs that break the rules and make a difference. Join the movement today and learn non-traditional techniques that give you an edge. Now, here's your chief marketing renegade, Drew Neiser. This episode, we really are spanning the globe for interesting marketing challenges and renegade thinkers. My guest today is is actually on the phone from Germany. His name is Martin Herring. He is the CMO of a newly amalgamated and now the third largest fintech company in the world. It's called Finastra. Now, for those of you who don't know what fintech is, just think about fintech as trying to do for uh, banking in the finance world as, say, uh, Facebook or Uber or Airb2b is doing for other categories. Help these financial institutions really disrupt um, the way they've been doing business and move to a way um, that we would all love them to do business. So, Martin, uh, welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite. It's really a pleasure to be with you. It's um it's exciting to talk to you from uh from Germany. Let's just step back for a second. Finastra is probably a name that most people who are listening hadn't heard of before and my guess is it's because it's relatively new. But it's this amalgam of of three companies. Talk a little bit about how you sort of made the decision to bring these companies together and then rebrand them and not keep one of the older brands. Sure. Um Finestra, as you said, uh, is now uh, the la- third largest uh, fintech in the world. And um, the company was coming together from two former brands uh, under the name of Mysis uh, and d um, Mysis is a, a, a long company in the market, almost for 30 years, uh, based out of the UK. And d uh, was a very successful ca- uh, company based in Canada. Uh, looking or overseeing the, the U.S. market. So the combination of the two companies uh, were very beneficial because we are now really a, a true global player. And the products we are offering for the banks are are um, serving 80% of what banks need today. So uh, you will see almost no bank in the world that has not a certain product um, of uh, Mises O and DNH. Now, when we brought these two companies together and both p- companies were sitting at approximately 5,000 employees, um, you think about which of the brands will survive. Um, and that's an interesting situation for each marketeer. Because yeah, and creating let me, a- let me stop you for a second there because this is really interesting and I, and I like to go micro sometimes on these things. So you have these two brands and in theory they had equity with your, those existing customers and those employees, right? So then you say, all right, we have these two brands. We're not going to, one of them is going to win. The other one's not going to win. We're going to do a new one. How did you make that assessment? Well, as, as you said, it, it's um, normally when you uh, merge two companies, uh, one will always survive from a branding perspective. In most cases, uh, most of the mergers in the market, one brand will survive. And therefore, as an executive management team, um, it took us a while um, to make also the decision to create a new brand. And the decision was not an easy one. Even for a marketeer, is not an easy one because there's an, a golden rule, never change a successful brand. But both brands were successful. Now, the reason we have changed it was simply from an employee perspective. We thought that um, if you leave one brand outside, the other 5,000 people will not feel at home under the old brand. So we wanted a definitely reset of the company, a reset in the mind of people, a reset also from our strategy that we had in the past, uh, which created a lot of uh, motivation and, and buzz amongst uh, our own population and our own employees. And I think that's important for every market here that you create the emotional moment uh, when you have a new brand uh, and the emotional moment uh, stimulates and, and, and uh, motivates 10,000 people to uh, to go for a new journey. So that, that was mainly the reason. And that's and interesting. And I, I want to come, I want to definitely dive into the employee part of this. Uh, I think that uh, the, one of the most overlooked parts of marketing still, and even though we, we talk a lot about this on the show is just got to getting em- employees first, getting employees on board with the brand, whether it's a new brand or a new campaign. Uh, you really, if you, if they're not on board, then really, Chances are it's going to be a failure. But before we get there, I'm wondering if there's 
any kind of sophisticated financial analysis involved here because brands equal equity, equity equals ability for a salesperson to say, hey, I'm calling for my sis, you know, that brand that you've done business with before. That has value. And so you suddenly have to go from X percent awareness to zero percent awareness and you have to start again, right? Did Is there any kind of business analysis or is this just sort of a gut decision? No, uh, of course not. Um, now in the B2B space, um, I would say there's a kind of rule of thumb that the brand equity of a B2B player uh, is round about 15% of the total company value. So if you just take that brand down, it's, it's, it's a reasonable amount of money that you're talking here. So on the other side, when you ramp up a new brand, um, you, you lose that brand equity. Um, and therefore, this whole thing is not an easy decision. But on the other side, you have two brands that are in the market for decades. Um, and when you are in the banking industry for such a long time and you are competing suddenly with all these new fintech players, with all the millennials on board, you are you – are, not competing in the right league and we wanted to create a very different perception in the market a perception of innovation thought leadership we want to be called a fintech and not a legacy banking software player anymore so we want to get rid of this legacy image uh, really push the reset button also from a product and strategy perspective and go into the future with a very different perception in the market, a perception that we are now starting to create over the next two, three, four years. And it takes three, four years from a branding perspective to settle a new brand into the market. It's really interesting. There's so many interesting parts of this. So this is, and folks, and I'm going to just make this clear. This is a moment of renegade thinking. You've got two brands. You could have gone with one of them. Instead, you, you start, uh, you reset. And I think there's so many interesting things that you said there that I just want to highlight that this notion that if you really want to change perceptions of your company and your brand, sometimes you need a new brand. And, and I think that's fascinating that you too, even though you were already competing in, uh, in these areas and providing new kinds of services, it was actually easier to sort of say, okay, Finastra is, is fintech and that whatever you used to know about those other things, we're going to start again. So, all right. I, I said we were going to go back to talk about the employee rollout of this thing because I, you have to market to employees. Talk a little bit about how you did this, how long it took, what were some of the things that, that worked and, and seemed to get employees excited about the new brand? Well, the first thing that, um, is exciting is, is how do you create a new brand name? Um, because there are so many um, legal hurdles that you need to cross because you, you just can't put a name into the market. Uh, it's a very long cycle to just identify the right name of the new company. As simple as this might sound, but it's very complex in the background. Uh, it starts with a list of 100 proposed names uh, that you need to boil down to maybe 10. Uh, then you have large trademarks checks and and language checks so that you are not coming up with a with a name that might sound nice in the UK but insults people in China. Um, but what's even more important is that your name creates a story right from the start. Um, in marketing, we are all storytellers, right? We have to create emotions. And if you put a brand out, you need to make sure that 10,000 people in the background would say, what a great idea. What a great story. This is my personal company. This, this, this story is easy to tell and I can tell it to my grandma and make, maybe even make her exciting. So, when we put the name in place, um, the name is a conglomerate of two things. FIN, which stands for Financial uh, Industries, Financial Technologies. And the second was is, is Astra. And Astra is the Latin word for star. So we wanted to be a star in the financial industry, in the financial software industry. Um, we want to be the new shining star in this universe. So all our events that we are creating right now are called Finastra Universe. Um, and that comes along with a, with a new different thinking. So it's not just continuing what we have done in the past, selling software, shrink wrap software. Um, but we want to start now a, a new 
journey, which is called uh, platform as a service. Um, we have cr uh, put all our software now into the cloud and we have opened up that cloud to all the fintechs in the world so they can start to build financial applications on top of that platform. What is force.com for Salesforce? More or less Finastra is now for the financial uh, industry and community to build new innovation on top. Our new principle is that we want that innovation happens outside of Finastra, but takes the Finastra platform uh, as the stable backend infrastructure to, to drive uh, financial success. Okay. So, so we have completely moved away and we wanted to build a new story from the start, uh, starting with that name. That's very cool. It's a perfect place for us to take a break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to spend a little bit more time just breaking down some of the things that got you to the brand. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some other cool things that you're, you're doing. So, uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Drew. I have a question for you, the audience. How good is your content? We all believe in content marketing, but is your content good enough for you to share it with the CEO and want him to share it with his peers? Is it good enough for your salespeople to share with their prospects? Heck, is it good enough for you to share it with your mom? If the answer to all of those questions was, no, well, it's not that good, and you're also celebrating things like National Donut Day, it's probably a good idea to do a content audit. And I know just the person to help you out with that. Text content audit to 917-679-8852. That's actually my cell phone. And we can talk about how to get your content to be world class and do all the things that you know it should be able to do. So you can text content audit to 917-679-8852. And let's figure out together how to get your content to cut through. All right. My guest is Martin Herring who is the CMO of Finastra, which is aspires to be a star in the financial services technology world. Uh, we were just learning about the, the Finastra universe and the, or, and the, uh, how the name came to be. I just want to, before we move on, did you work with an outside firm to come up with the brand name? Uh, yes, uh, you can't do this with, with outside firms. Uh, there are legal uh, firms involved, trademark firms involved, uh, creative agencies involved. Uh, this is something that, that needs a larger uh, supporting ecosystem surround, surrounded. Um, otherwise, you will fail. Oh, my gosh, yeah. So I, I will tell, tell uh, the audience this. I've been in the business a long time. My least favorite aspect of marketing is brand naming, um, although one of my proudest moments was coming up with the uh, tough book for, for Panasonic um, because it really set the platform, but it is hard because you get Absolutely. really excited about a brand name and then you go to clear it and it clears in two countries, but it doesn't clear in, you know, in 20, you can't get the URL. I just, there's so many things that come up with it. And of course, then there's always the risk that when it's translated uh, into uh, Greek, it, it means, yeah, you know, that it brought your grandparents back from the grave. So you have to be careful with this naming thing. It's really a tough, tough But world. it's also, but it's also challenging inside the company because when you um, ramp up a new brand and you talk about colors and graphics, everybody who has ever seen a TV commercial or an advertising starts to be a CMO. So suddenly, even on the board level, you talk to 15 other, 15 other CMOs and everybody gives you advice. Um, sometimes the challenge internally is bigger than the channels, uh, challenge uh, externally. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I've had lots of conversations with, uh, with CMOs about their boards and it's one area. <laughs> it's like a board member who, let's say, um, came from the legal profession would never sort of say, um, Hey, uh, you, Mr. Technology officer, here's how you should let me have a, make a comment about your technology or let me make a comment about your financial system. But they have no problem without <laughs> making a comment about their marketing because Everybody's an art director, right? Uh, I can't agree more. <laughs> but that's okay. All right. So, um, you have this challenge. Uh, you get, uh, employees excited about it. How long between creating the name and sort of rolling it out? How long did it take to roll out internally? The uh, time frame to do this was an amazing six months. Um, and, um, 
it's hard to believe that from the the moment that you know that you create a new company to the moment you launch a new brand in the market, it's it's just six months. Um, the reason for that was that these companies came together very quickly, um, and we wanted to do this in a very short time frame because we didn't want to leave employees in the dark what will happen. So. Um, the time frame, as I said, from launching the new company to launching the brand in the market was just six months. Now, we did this in coincident with a, with a big, um, sales conference. So every year we are collecting approximately thousand people in one location to talk about our products, to train them. And, and this was the time where in front of a thousand people, we were launching on stage, uh, the Finestra brand. And at the same time, um, all the press releases, uh, the, the new website, everything had to be rolled in uh, to get people excited, um, video content, content marketing, social channels. Uh, this was all pushed uh, at the same time, uh, but the prep time for that was, was probably three to four months real work um, to get this done. Okay, that's really fast. Um, I've, I've heard it done a little bit faster, but not often. Um, so were there any things and, and it was nice that you had a deadline in the sense that you had this user conference coming up and so you had to do it, but were there any sort of surprises or hurdles or things that you learned as a result of this rollout that you go, Oh God, I wish we had done that a little bit differently. Um, I, I think, um, there, there's always things that you could have done a, a, a bit better, um, especially if timing is, is so tight. Um, I, I think especially checking, um, if, if messaging resonates really around the globe, um, you would normally do this two or three or four uh, months, um, in advance. Uh, we just had two or three weeks time to check the final messaging, uh, that this works around the globe. But overall, I, I was, quite happy with the launch and uh, a lot of users and press and analysts said it was absolutely the right thing to do because finally uh, you are running here in a risk uh, you don't know how how the new brand will be received in the market and we did immediately after the the brand launch um, a Q&A with uh, important uh, press people and analysts out there how the new message resonates with, with them and it's what's extremely positive so one of the things that's interesting is, so a new brand, but if, it, you know, one might argue that you could just change your name, but it's still just lipstick on a pig, right? You're still the same company. What I heard you say was that you were also at the same time evolving your actual deliverables and that when you brought these two companies together, it wasn't just, hey, these two companies have a new name, but these two companies together actually have a new vision, a new product, a new service. The whole, everything about the company was was going to change. Absolutely. Um, and um, a brand starts with a, with a bold vision. Our, our bold vision is that we want to unlock the potential of people and businesses by creating an open platform for collaboration for the financial services industry. That's our big vision. That's a big vision, and and therefore, the underlying technology and the architecture and our solution has to change. Instead of selling individual solutions to individual banks, we want to provide a financial banking platform on which other people can innovate and innovate new products. Um, there's an important sentence which uh, I always reemphasize a lot of times. Uh, 99% of innovation in a company, uh, uh, sorry, in a in a specific industry, will not happen in your own company. It will happen outside. So if you don't leverage the innovation and leadership from a broader community, I think you are missing a trick. So we want to monetize our platform, but this platform builds the basis, the fundament for fintechs, for banks. Uh, for for developer, even for schools and universities to deliver uh, financial applications. It's almost like an app store, but for the financial services world. That's the big idea, and that big idea is connected uh, to the brand. And it is a big, bold vision. And, and the thing that I'm thinking about as you're talking about that, it's one thing to roll out a new logo and a new artwork and design and change the signage for all the locations and give everybody business cards. It's another thing to build a new platform, <laughs> right? And, and 
you you get the vision along the way. I mean, how close are you at this point to uh, uh, realizing that vision? Now, the good thing is uh, in the banking industry, things are not happening overnight. Um, in the banking industry, um, I give you an example. If you want to change the core banking system, um, sometimes you have uh, cycles of 10 to 15 years until banks really change their core banking infrastructure. And uh, a bank doesn't want into risk. So a revolutionary approach in a bank doesn't work. Uh, it's more an evolutionary approach. And because of of the bank of the pressure in in the current banking space in terms of costs um uh, lower margins bank wants to see uh the the future over probably the next 4 or 5 years so if you tell them about that platform idea if you tell them that they can go with us um on on that uh, road then they are excited they they don't need the solution in the next 3 months they are they also have a long term uh, horizon um so our vision and our strategy really resonates with them and if we can deliver this over the next 2 3 years they are completely fine with that okay so that that makes sense that they're they're not going to they're not going to change the way they're doing business tomorrow anyway. So together you can work with them to, uh, to make some of these changes. Correct. Uh, okay. That makes sense. It's a perfect place for us to take a break. When we come back, we're going to spend a little time looking at the future and some of the, uh, some of the things that, uh, that Martin is exploring and, uh, the world of financial technology. Hey, it's Drew. I was at a conference the other day and somebody looked at my saw lapel pen and said, what's up with that? And I said, well, what's the one thing that marketing has always had to do? Forget digital, forget all this stuff. What is the one marketing imperative? And uh, he looked at me and went, cut through. And I went, yes, ding, 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 ding. That's right. Cut through. That is what marketing must do. And it's not just cutting through the clutter, although that's really important because if your marketing doesn't th cut through the clutter, it's like the proverbial tree in the forest that falls and nobody hears it. But it's also cutting through the crap and the processes that inhibit innovation. We've been working a lot lately with some CMOs to help them cut through the crap and get at the essence of what is their big idea and how can they make a case to expand that idea across their business? That, to me, is cutting through. Okay, we're back. My guest is Martin Herring. That's an A with an umlaut for those folks who were paying attention here. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to find that in the show notes. Um, you, um, you did an interview, um, I saw, with a very human looking and sounding android, uh, or uh, talk a little bit about, um, that in, in terms of, uh, just how fun, what was, it, you know, what, what were you, what was the message that you were trying to send, uh, when you, when you did that? Um, so I interviewed, um, I would say almost a celebrity um, in the world of humanoids. Um, her name is Sophia. She was talking four weeks ago at, at the United Nations. Um, about the way how robots uh, can bring more humanity to mankind. Isn't that an interesting thought? Yeah. Um, she also entertained 50,000 people at the recent Web Services Summit in, in Lisbon. So I thought it's a, it's a nice segue into what we try um, in the banking space because artificial intelligence, uh, humanoids, robots, machine learning, deep learning, all these buzzwords will, will fundamentally change the way uh, people consume financial services from from their banks. So I thought it's it was would be really nice to get Sophia on stage and and interview her and and ask her what she thinks where artificial intelligence and humanoids can can play a role in financial services. So this is where I, I, probably this was my little renegade inside to say, hey, we 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 need to be a bit more disruptive here, uh, and the feedback was was awesome. Uh, we, we had tons of journalists at at that event uh, and people who want to take selfies afterwards with Sophia, because she was. It was almost really scary to talk with her, because on top of uh, the way she moves uh, and, and talks, uh, she has, for example, cameras in her eyes, so she can recognize if if uh, you're excited um, or if you laugh. Um, she uh, she responds so natural, um, 
and her face uh, in her face are 32 little motors that are controlling the whole face movements in a way um which is which was really scary and um yeah, we had an interview to, about how AI will change the way of, of banking going forward. Uh, quite interesting. It was, wow, that's, that's so cool. I'm very jealous. That would be a, an amazing experience. And one of the, just one of those moments in marketing where marketing is, uh, is really fun and you're literally facing the future. Um, talk about the, the conversation. I mean, what, what were her answers, uh, uh, credible? Um, ab- absolutely. Um, now, because of every interview that she d- did in the past, um, her her memory and how to answer certain questions is increasing day by day by day, um, and therefore her her, her, her uh, answers were not um, kind of vanilla answers. Um, it really was g- going back to financial services. When I asked her what kind of role does AI play in the financial services sector, she didn't give me a vanilla response on just. Uh, we made it even even further than that. I, I took the risk to put her in front of a journalist and give this journalist 20 minutes of time to talk to her about financial services and AI hey Martin. without really knowing hey Martin, what, we had a, she, how, how she would respond. We had a, a break in the uh, in the thing, and so I want to re-record the, no problem. So one portion of it. So I'm going to ask the question again. So... When you were interviewing Sophia, were her answers credible? Um, absolutely credible. Not only from a, a syntax and semantic, it, it was not a vanilla answer. It rolled back to what AI really matter for in, in the financial services area. Uh, we, we even played it to the more extreme in inviting a journalist to talk to her for 20 minutes wow. without knowing how she would respond. And the journalist was, was really thrilled. Uh, um, it was the first moment that Sophia took over the co- conversation and asking back the journalist questions. Um, it was really a scary moment. Even the journalist told me, wow, I wouldn't have expected that kind of natural conversation. It's uh, amazing. I have a feeling that uh, I'm going to end up very soon having a Sophia-like character uh, on the show. <laughs> you, you, are, you are invited to, uh, to come to New York in two weeks. We, ha- we have Sophia on stage at Finestra Universe, New York. I wonder if she'll want to do a podcast with us. Uh, maybe. That, that would be hilarious. Uh, well, let me know on that one. Okay. So um, so that's a, a sort of really smart – I mean, you were talking about helping financial services getting into the future, and Sophia sort of is a wonderful – a bright, shiny object, as we would call it, that that sort of says, see, this is the future. We're bringing that to you. And that's a metaphor for all the services that we're providing uh, and plan to provide. So very cool uh, idea. Do you see and are you building um, AI uh, solutions into into your platform? Yes, absolutely. Because AI will really, as I said, change uh the banking and financial industry in a in a big way. Um, when you think w- when you open up your your mobile banking application, uh, instead of just looking at at, at your account balance, uh, wouldn't it be nice if the bank could automatically give you advice uh, what next financial transaction or service would make sense for you? Um, for example. Your 18 year old boy has just turned 18 and the banking application would say, Hey, I'm just uh, seeing that you're turning 18. First of all, congratulations. And I guess you might want a car. Uh, can I offer you, especially for young people, a, c- a certain car loan at a very low interest rate? Something like that, where based on the transaction uh, that you have made with a bank in the past, based on the location uh, information that your phone is giving back to the bank, um, a certain recommendation, uh, I think this would increase the level of customer experience quite drastically. It would make the banking application much more sticky. Uh, and especially in uh, for people who are more a bit tech-savvy, uh, I think it would resonate quite well. Um, on top, for example, ex, um, things like chatbots. Uh, a lot of people talk about chatbots. Um, in Germany, when you want to go to a bank, um, the opening hours are from 9 to 12 and from 2 to 4 p.m. So normally, as a, as a usual 
a person who's who's in 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 business you can't access your agent in the bank so what about if you would have a smart chatbot on your mobile application again um serving probably 80% of all the questions that that you would have so i think in terms of customer experience um and of selling more services from a bank perspective ai will will change the way going forward yeah i i it's funny one of the earlier episodes was with dan gingas of uh mcdonald's and and i think as a consumer, we don't always think that, gee, what I want to do is deal with a chatbot. But when, as we were talking about, uh, the role that a chatbot could play for McDonald's, if somebody, you know, tweets out, Hey, uh, how many calories in a Big Mac? You don't need a human to answer that question. And so that becomes an instant service. Uh, but if there's an issue with, say, a burger not being warm and it's at a particular location, you want an individual to say, gee, I'm sorry, you had a bad experience. And uh, so it becomes a very interesting way of this sort of human bot and how the also how bots can help humans and, and do better it, job. It, Exactly, and 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 connect the idea of a of a, a normal text chatbot with voice recognition. So we what we just recently released, which is which is again disrupting the industry. You you just say to Alexa, which we have coupled with our financial backend system, and say, Alexa, can I um, pay Drew two hundred bucks? And Alexa will recognize this uh, and with our open platform connect it back to our financial backend system and, and make the payment transfer. Um, this is the way you, you want to do it. You don't want to go into your mobile front and type in all this information. You just want to talk to someone and say, make the transfer. That's it. Yeah, I uh, I like the idea of people saying, "Hey Alexa, pay Drew two hundred dollars." That sounds good to me. <laughs> um, you know, if enough people did it, then that starts to add up to real money. Um, so <laughs> let's look at uh, for you as you look ahead. What's um What's the biggest marketing challenge uh, for for you moving moving forward? I, I think um, first of all. Um, you constantly have to innovate in marketing. Um, um, finally, I would say um, you must always have that little renegade inside you. Otherwise, you shouldn't work in marketing. Um, and if you don't have that room, that wiggle room to drive innovation, you probably should leave the company you're working for. Um, and when I say you know, innovation, that means you as a CMO or every senior marketing executive should always wake up in the morning and, and ask yourself, is it good enough what I'm doing today? Is it innovative enough? Is it disruptive enough? Um, can I drive more, ch even more change? Um, and ask more your boss for excuse than for approval. Make the next step. But you can't be the best and the most creative uh, and smartest person in the universe. Uh, you also need on top to hire people surround you that are maybe even smarter than you that that bring that kind of innovation in into the company uh, because if you uh, don't keep up to date as a cmo i, I think over time you're you, you're just dead in the water uh, then you are part of the legacy uh, so this is i think the constant challenge um, be on top of of the latest and greatest innovation trend anticipate the trends in the right way and bring these trends back into the company uh, to bring the company a step forward. I, I think this this is the biggest challenge. Yeah, those are those are big ones, and I love um, all of the the parts, especially the part about renegade thinking. And uh, obviously, that's what what we're trying to do here uh, on the show, and then of course at, at my agency. So thank you for that. Um, I think this is a good place to wrap up. I'm going to take a quick uh, sort of recap, as I always do on the show, on sort of on the spot with a, a little, the sort of lessons that, that I got out of this, uh, this session. So first, sometimes when, when you merge, there's an opportunity to re assess your brands and decide, hmm, do we have the right brands? But I think whether or not you have, uh, whether it's a merger or not, sometimes if you really want to reinvent, there's no, choice but to um, actually rename yourself and sort of hit the reset button. And what I really admire about what Martin was talking about is the name was based on a vision. The vi the name then re helped them realize the vision, if you will, um, and that the vision wasn't just a new name, but it was actually a new way of going to market and sort of reinventing a category. And that's 
sort of that, that big, bold thing that a new company really should uh, have uh, as, as their marching orders. And so we have this new name, um, a vision that is clear. We roll that out internally first. Um, and then when we roll it out externally, we can't just say it. We have to show it. We have to prove that we're in this, um, whatever our promise is. In this case, uh, Martin was talking about sort of financial star. And so naming their event a financial universe, interacting with a, a with a, a humanoid a robot as a demonstration of um, of what it is that uh, the brand was promising. And so once again, we come back to my man, Ben Franklin, who said, well done is better than well said. Uh, Martin, well done and well said. Thank you so much for being on Renegade Thinkers Unite. Thanks for being part of the show. So, uh, all right, uh, all you listeners, if you found this content useful, as always, I will encourage you to share it with a friend, subscribe on your favorite uh, podcast channel, and uh, until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong. This has been Renegade Thinkers Unite, but it doesn't end there. Just go to RenegadeThinkersUnite.com for more and subscribe to the show. That way, you'll never miss an episode. We'll talk with you next time on Renegade Thinkers Unite.